If you will turn in your Bibles to the 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews as we continue our study through the Word. Well, we've come to the final chapter now of this amazing book, the book of Hebrews. And you'll remember that this letter was written to those Christians. They were Jewish Christians who were struggling because they were being persecuted and having such trials and difficulties in their lives. And the only thing that they were doing that was causing this persecution was that they loved Jesus. That's it. And because they loved Jesus, they were facing such opposition and difficulty from uh, the Jews had, who had remained in Judaism. And you remember that that persecution, that affliction that they were going through was so severe that it was really causing some to pause and to question, wouldn't our lives be easier if we just went with the flow? Wouldn't it be easier if we just went back to the temple and worshiped uh, underneath the law? God gave the law to Moses and, and we are God's people under the law. And so the writer of Hebrews wrote this letter of exhortation telling them, no, no, press on to the fullness of what God has for your life. Never settle. Never stop drawing near to God and, and your life is going to be blessed in the proximity that you spend your life to God. And as the doors have been flung open to where we no longer need to stand in the ante room, but we can come boldly into his presence, then take advantage of that and rush into that presence. And so that has been the message, that has been the heart that was behind this letter. Now, we saw in structure and format that the first 10 chapters of the book of Hebrews was really based around comparing and contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant and showing point by point how the new covenant is infinitely superior to the old covenant. And then we came to that 11th chapter. In the 11th chapter, really then, he stopped and paused and just basically dealt with the issue of faith. That without faith, it's impossible to please God. And that really the basis of faith is trusting God, believing what he says, receiving, listen to this, receiving truth from God and then navigating according to that truth. That God who at various times in his various ways has revealed himself to mankind, but that mankind has always had the free will, listen, to either reject the truth and navigate any way that they wanted or receive that truth and then obey accordingly. And so that has been the principle that has been unchanging from Adam and Eve all the way even to this day, that you have been given free will, I have been given free will, and everybody has that ability now to choose whether or not you're going to trust God and believe what he says and navigate accordingly. And then we went into chapter 11 with the halls of, of faith, and we saw the great cloud of witness of men and women just like you and I who God revealed truth to, and they stepped up, believed God, and God did amazing and wonderful things. And that fed right into that last chapter that we just looked at, chapter 12. And it starts off, since we have been surrounded by so great a crowd of witness, then let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. All of those men and women of the Bible, we see that they've already finished their race here upon this earth, but we are in our race right now. And so the writer encourages us, run the race to win. Let go of everything that slows you down and pursue the Lord at every turn. He went on to talk about the fact that when you do become chastened by the Lord, receive that. Our earthly fathers, they trained us. They instructed us. Why? Because they love us and because they wanted the best life for us. And so also our heavenly father is going to do that. But continue to chase after God. You remember that he told us to pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And so God loves you and he has a great plan for you. And his desire for you is that you would experience that tremendous peace, peace in your soul, peace with God, peace with others. And this is the quality of life that, that God desires for each and every one of us. And 
And so we uh, see here that, uh, that now as we turn to this final chapter, we are going to see again many tremendous exhortations in our lives. Now the question is, if we're going to run this race, what does the race look like? The, the race of faith. And what is it that we're supposed to be doing? And so these are the exhortations that we're going to receive in this chapter that kind of coaches us up as we are on the course, as we are living out our lives, and as we are running the race of faith. And so here in this 13th chapter, in the very first verse, he begins by saying, let brotherly love, what? continue. Now, if you are to continue in something, it means that you've already what? Started. So here we see the expectation is that we're already about our father's business of loving others. And so this brotherly love, how radical our lives change when we come to Christ, when we are able now to be able to crucify our flesh and to be able to be outwardly focused. You see, prior to Christ, we lived trying to take from everybody the love and the things that we needed to be able to build our lives into this well-managed structure that works. But we see that when Christ comes into our heart, he tells us that we are now to tear down that old life and that it is going to be built afresh, anew. And that what God is going to do is that God is going to fill us with his love. And then our love is going to, his love is going to flow out of our lives onto those people that are around us. And so we see that this brotherly love continuing in loving others. Jesus said this. He said that the testimony to the world, they will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have one for another, that this love that flows out of us onto others is going to be so significant to, that the world around us is going to say, okay, whoa, what is going on with those Christians? Have you noticed they have got something that we don't have? And so here as we're running the race, what's the most important thing is to allow God's love to be flowing out of our lives on to others. And so he exhorts us now to continue in brotherly love. Now, remember, he had said to take the, the feeble arms and strengthen them and to strengthen the legs and now to run with endurance the race. And so what is this endurance? What is this race that we're running? It is this race uh, of loving others, of taking God's love and pouring it onto the people that are around us. Now, one of the things that it says that we have to do in order to be able to love others is we have to crucify our flesh. Because see, selfishness and self-centeredness and self-importance, this is what contains us and prevents us from being able to love others. And so Jesus told us that we have to pick up our cross and crucify our flesh. How often? Daily. Oh my goodness. It's a daily effect. Your flesh every single day wants to dominate you. It wants you to think about itself, take care of it, and don't take care of anybody else. But we see that in order for us to be able to love others, we have to get ourselves uh, out of the way. And that is that crucifying of the flesh. I want you to know that self-importance and self-centeredness has always been a challenge for every single person from the beginning of, uh, of mankind. But I believe, listen, I believe this next generation, you millennials and those that are behind the millennials, I think that you have got an even greater challenge than the other generations that have come before you to be able to crucify yourself. And I believe that is the effect of social media in your life. Social media makes you the star of your life. Social media now makes you post selfies and to be able to have everybody else see what's going on in your life, to make your life look so wonderful and so great. And then as you're the star of your own life, right, you're always checking to find out who liked your posts and whether or not you're trending, you know, and, and all of these things. And so what does that do? That puts more of a focus onto yourself from the first minute that you wake up. You want to check your Facebook. You want to check your Twitter. You want to check your posts and see what's going on within that virtual community. And so that is going to put a, a focus on self. But love flowing through you onto others is going to require 
for you to get yourself out of the way. You see, when we are looking at ourselves and self-centered, that's when we're taking a mirror and we're looking into the mirror. When you look in a mirror, you can't see what's behind the mirror. You only see the reflection of yourself. But God wants you to take the mirror and turn it into a pane of glass so that you can look right through that pane of glass. And now guess what? You see others. And you see the others that are around you now to be able to love. The more that you're staring at yourself, then the less that you're able to look at others. And so the challenge for us as believers is to be able to crucify that flesh and to be able to love others. And so he says, let us continue, 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 continue in loving others. He goes on in, in verse two, he says, do not forget to entertain strangers for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. So here we see that, that this is the word for hospitality, to entertain. And that word literally means to have a love of strangers. Now, within the context, what it was talking about is that we have to make sure that we are hospitable to people even that we don't know, right? Brotherly love, we start with the people that are right around us. We start with friends and family and neighbors and coworkers and the people that we are connected to. But then the next fear of loving others goes to strangers, people that we don't know. And so here we see the exhortation was to entertain strangers. Now, the context of that, remember that back in the day that this was written, that there weren't hotels and more motels, that there were, there were not any clean, safe, moral environments where travelers could spend the night, be refreshed, and be on their way. The only places were the taverns that were just lascivious and they were moral bogs that people would be you know involved in staying there and so what happened is is that as christians would now be traveling they would oftentimes turn to the church and ask is there anybody that can put us up as we are traveling through and so the church would go to the body and ask for people to to allow christian travelers to come and to spend the night and would they open up their homes and, and entertain them and so we see that this now is that extension of brotherly love. But we also see here that even within the church itself, there is the, the stretching of us to be beyond our comfort zone, to be able to love more than just the people that we know. And so it starts right within the, the congregation itself, right within us. It's interesting how oftentimes that we tend to sit in the same seats in church. Amen. Anybody have their names kind of etched uh, into their seats? And it's funny when you have season tickets, you know, to a sporting event, you actually have your tickets. You get to know the people that are around you. They're there for, for all the games. But if someone's sitting in your seat, you know, you know they're in your seat. You get the usher and have them removed. And oftentimes in church, it's like, I, you know, they're in our seats, you know, but you can't have the usher remove them because you don't actually have tickets to those uh, seats. But the thing is, is that you want to be able to get to know the people that are sitting around you, to actually learn their names, to stretch beyond just yourself and to let the love of God. I've often thought, man, church would be much better if we all wore name tags, you know, so we could remember each other's names and we could start to, to grow in connecting with loving others rather than just getting in, sitting in our section and getting back out again. And, and you only had to shake the hands of two people because you were made to, you know, during the, the time of greeting. But we want to be able to continue to, to open up our hearts, open up our lives, and to love others. Here it says that, that in entertaining strangers that we may have actually even entertained angels, unwittingly entertained angels. And of course, in the Old Testament, we see that there are examples of that. You remember how Abraham and Sarah, they, they entertained angels, didn't know that they were angels at the time, but they ended up actually being angels. Lot entertained uh, angels. And, and we also see that Gideon uh, as well. And so these were just, you know, they, they didn't know that they were angels, but the thought that there are angels here amongst us and that we may have interacted with angels. I mean, that's an awesome thought. I met an angel one time. Eyes were crystal blue her name was Amber. I ended up marrying her. <laughs> and so for 20 years, I've been married now. 
<laughs> to an angel. But we can meet angels, and there are angels that are amongst us. In verse 3, it says, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. So he says, brotherly love, start with the people that you know, extend it to strangers. And then what's the next peripheral after that? Man, those that are being persecuted, those that are now suffering. Remember even uh, the unfortunate and the prisoners. Here again, the context of this was that there were men and women believers that were being arrested and chained up just for their faith, just because they love Jesus. I want you to know that around the world today, there are people who are being persecuted, who are in prison, who are even losing their life today just simply because they love Jesus like you love Jesus and like I love Jesus. They've done nothing else except they just love Jesus and they are being persecuted. And so it says, remember them. It says, as if chained to them. It's one thing to just kind of have a general awareness, but how aware are you of someone who's chained to you? I mean, every single time they move, you know, your arm moves here. There's a, a tremendous connection. And he says, why? Because they're a part of the body of Christ. And we are the body of Christ, universal on the whole face of the earth. We are connected together. Race, creed, color, language all fall away. We are in one body of believers. And so those who suffer, we are to remember them as well. In verse 4, he shifts gears now and says, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. So here we see that there were those people that said that if you stay away from marriage and if you just remain celibate, that you're a better Christian than those who get married and, and serve the Lord within marriage. And so here we see that in the letter to Hebrews, he just debunks that here. And he lets us know that God is the one that created marriage. Marriage is the institution, the covenant uh, that God established where the two would become one. And so there is this oneness of marriage that we see that we are called to. And through that, then we have been given the, the sexual intimacy has been given by God to us as a gift. And so God created sex and he has sanctified sex. That is a gift, but he has also put boundaries around it as well. And he has said that sexual intimacy is only to be enjoyed within the context of marriage. Now, God is also the one who defined marriage. Today, we live in a culture that is seeking to redefine marriage. But here's the issue with that. God is the one that has authority over marriage. He's the one that created it and established it as a covenant. Now, the culture has come along and said that it wants to redefine what marriage is. The problem is the culture doesn't have authority over it because it's not the cultures. It's God. And the only one that could change the definition of marriage would be God. But God never changes. And so we have an unchanging definition of truth revealed in God's word with regards to marriage. Now, sex outside of marriage, God says, is prohibited. It is sin to take what God has placed inside the confines of marriage and then to go and to enjoy it without the constraint of marriage. Now, he says that he will judge that. He says that fornicators and adulterers that he is going to judge. Now, here again, we see that a fornicator is a single person. If you're single, and you're taking and enjoying sexual intimacy while you're single, then that's fornication. You are not supposed to be doing that according to God's law. He says that you're going to be judged for that. He says also, now, if you are married and you are enjoying physical intimacy, sexual intimacy with anybody other than your spouse, so your sexual intimacy is outside of the boundaries uh, uh, of a marriage, then he says, now that's adultery. And so whether you're a single person that's involved in sexual intimacy or you are married and going outside of the boundaries, then you now are taking what God has preserved and reserved for inside of a marriage relationship. You're taking it out and God says, no, that is sin. And he says that God will judge. 
Now, I want you to know that today, one of the chief issues that we're struggling with in our culture today is homosexuality. And you have got the homosexual and the lesbian communities that are now struggling to be able to be joined together and, and to enjoy physical intimacy outside of the constraints now of what God has declared. I want you to know that whether or not you're homosexual or heterosexual, that makes no difference whatsoever. Sexual intimacy was reserved by God within marriage. So now what's happened is, is that the homosexuals say, well, then let's get married. But they're trying to redefine God's definition of marriage so that they can fit it into marriage. And now they can have sanctified physical intimacy. The problem is, is that they cannot change God's definition of marriage so that they now can enjoy a union that is within God's plan for what marriage is. Now, oftentimes we hear the issue, well, I'm born this way. And we will hear this all the time. Well, I was born this way. And so there's nothing that I can do about it. I have to be free to be who I am. What's the Christian response to that? First of all, here is the reality. We love everybody. Amen. God calls us to love everybody. The church loves everybody. As Christians, we love everybody. Here's the bottom line. There's none righteous. No, not one. Every single one of us, here's the reality. We were born sinners. Amen. Every single one of us born a sinner. We're all born sinners. And every single one of us is enticed to sin differently based upon who we are and what our appetites are. Sin is always enticing. Sin has always been enticing. Sin will always be enticing. Because you're enticed by sin does not, listen, does not give you permission to sin. And so because you struggle with same-sex attraction, that's no different than being attracted to any other sin that there is. But the justification that I can't help it, and so now I am going to pursue what God has said is wrong. This is where we draw the line and where we separate it. Now, do we love them? We absolutely love them. We, they have their free will. They can do whatever they want. This is the revelation of truth to them. And then they have to respond to that truth with their free will to either navigate according to the truth or to shove it aside. And then they are going to suffer the consequences. God says that he will judge. So it's not our place to judge anybody. What do we do? We look to the truth and we tell them, hey, this is what God is saying. And we're going to navigate by truth. And we suggest everybody navigate by truth or there's going to be consequences in our lives when we don't navigate by truth. And so we love every single person. We are a collection of sinners. And so whether or not you are heterosexual or homosexual, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you are fornicating or whether you are an adulterer. If you are taking sex outside of the boundaries that God has put in it, that is wrong. And God says, listen, God says, he's going to judge. We're going to keep on loving you and we're going to keep on encouraging you to listen to what God says. And if you want your life to be blessed, then navigate according to the truth of God's word. And so he goes on now in verse five to say, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. So now he talks about the fact of covetousness. He says, don't let covetousness get a foothold in your life. So often times we can be discontent in our life because we look at others. We're comparing and contrasting what we have with others. And so that's what covetousness is. Covetousness is when you're looking at other people and saying, man, I wish I had what they had. I want that person's job. I want that person's vacation. I want this person's lifestyle. I want this person's, you know, and, and we look and we compare ourselves with everybody else and we want now what they have. It's interesting. We were content with what we had till we saw what they have. <laughs> and then suddenly what we have now doesn't look so good. And now we want what others have. I want you to know what God is telling us is this. That is an endless downward spiral. It will never, ever make you happy. 
No matter how much you have in this world, possessions will never fulfill you. You will never be happy. When you are motivated by covetousness, uh, you are heading in a downward spiral in the wrong direction. And so he says, now let your conduct be without covetousness. He says, be content with such things as you have. See, God wants you to be content. And I want you to know that being content is a choice that you make. It is the ability to sit there and to say, I am blessed by God. And I am thankful for all of the blessings that God has given to me. And so I am choosing to be content with my life. You see, we're covetous because we want what others have because we think that that would be a better life for us. But do you want to know what the best life that you have is God's will for your life? God's will for your life is the perfect life. And if you're chasing, listen, any other life other, other than the perfect life that God already has planned for you, then you are chasing after less than. And so God says to be content. Here's the reality. Listen to this. It can change your life. If you are not content today, you will not be content tomorrow. Amen? Because it's a choice that you make. It's a choice to say thank you to God. It's a choice of being thankful for the blessings that you already have in your life and to recognize that the life that God has for you is your best life that there is. And so we, we are thankful. We're thankful to God for all of the blessings that we have. That's where contentment comes from. And so what are some of the blessings that we've enjoyed? Do you realize that just being able to do what we're doing right now, coming together to worship the Lord corporately without the fear of the government coming in and arresting us and throwing us all into prison. Do you realize what a blessing it is that we are experiencing here this morning? Do you realize how many people around the world wish that they could come and worship the Lord corporately, but don't even have the privilege and the blessing of what we are enjoying right here? And so that contentment comes from recognizing how much you already have. The enemy wants you to look at what you don't have. But here's the reality. There's no such thing as a perfect life. Amen? Amen. There's no such thing as a perfect life. And yet we chase after it as if thinking that there is a perfect life. That's the enemy. He wants you dissatisfied with what you have to chase after an illusion and cast away what is valuable in your life. And so God says, no, be content. Be able to say, I am blessed. Say that with me. I am blessed. I'm blessed this morning. I'm blessed with an abundance of blessings that are in my life. And do you know what? I'm content with the blessings that God chooses to give me. You see, he has given me the parameters in my life and it is inside of those parameters. Listen, that is where there are the green pastures and the still waters for me to come and to live my life. This is the best in place that there is. Now the enemy tells you, no, you need to step outside of those boundaries and, and, and come over here to the fence and look over at that grass over there. Isn't that, doesn't that look good? And, and the enemy wants you to now fence crawl. Don't fence crawl. And the enemy wants you to just leave the pen completely and to come out from the fence and, and to enter into the world. But God put those barriers in your life, not to restrict you, listen to this, to protect you to bless you, to keep danger away from you so that you're free to live in a beautiful surrounding life and environment. Listen, the fence around a playground isn't there to restrict the kids from having fun. They don't say, hey, how can we ruin the kids' fun out on this playground? Let's put a fence around them, you know? What's that fence there? It's to protect them from running out into the street, getting hit by cars, be able to protect them so that they're free to run around anywhere on that playground and to be able to enjoy and have fun in a safe environment. That's the same thing that God does in our lives. And so contentment comes from recognizing that those boundaries that God puts there isn't to restrict you. The boundaries there are to set the boundaries for you to now run around and have fun and enjoy your life and know that you are going to be blessed. Be content, he says. Don't covet what other people have. Be happy for them. 
and now enjoy what God has given to you. He's given more than enough uh, to be able to celebrate and to be able to be thankful for. And so verse 7, he goes on now to say, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. So we're told to recognize and to follow godly leadership within the, the body of Christ. And so just as the church needs godly leaders, it also needs for the body of Christ to be godly followers uh, as well. In verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. forever. And so forever means forever. And so he is unchanging. God is unchanging. Now, the theological word for unchanging is immutability. That's the, the big word. It means it's impossible for the character of God to change. Now, I want you to look around the world today, right now, real quickly in your mind, and tell me what doesn't change. You see, every single thing in the world changes. The economy changes, fashion changes, culture changes, the landscape changes that are around us, weather patterns change that are around us. Every single thing, our bodies change. <laughs> uh, every single thing changes that are around us. The only thing that doesn't change is God. And God has said, look, I'm the foundation. Build your life on top of what does not change. And when you build your life on what doesn't change, it is sure and secure. And when trials and tribulations and difficulties and hardships come, the house that's built upon an unchanging foundation is going to stand through those trials. When you build your life on anything other than what doesn't change, as it changes, it's going to crack the foundation and eventually that house is going to tumble. And so how good is it to know that God never changes and that we can build our lives based upon the one thing that doesn't change in the uncertainty of everything that changes around us, build your life upon the one thing that does not change and that is God. It says in verse nine, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines for it is good that the heart be established by grace not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. So interesting, it says, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. I want you to notice something really quick with me, that it doesn't say don't be carried about with various and false doctrines. Notice that? See a difference between strange doctrines and false doctrines. We see throughout the scriptures warn us about false teachers and false doctrines entering in. But it says, do not get consumed with strange doctrines. What is it really saying? It says major on the majors and don't get pulled into the, the sidelines and into the murky eddies that are around. Because when you start focusing on the minors, you miss the majors. Now, what would be an example of that? Well, Baptism. Baptism would be an example of that. Do you know how many different positions there are on baptism and how many churches teach different things? Some say that the only way to be baptized is that you have to be completely immersed. Some say that you have to be completely immersed facing backwards. Uh, uh, some say that you're not to be immersed, but you're only supposed to be sprinkled. Others say, no, you're not baptized unless you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And others say, no, you're supposed to be baptized in Jesus' name only. And church have all of these opinions over all of these things. See, this would be the very <laughs> strange forms of doctrine to where we start boring into these divisions here. What does the Bible say? Get baptized. Okay. You know, I mean, with a squirt gun if necessary. I mean, it doesn't matter. You're missing the whole point. How, it, here's the issue. How's your relationship with God doing? And how's your relationship with others? Are you loving God? Are you loving others? Let's stay on the main path and not start to get caught up into all of these little things where people then start to make those the major. And so uh, he says also to make sure that our heart is established by grace. What does that mean? It means make sure that your relationship with God, listen, is based upon grace. See, it says, and not on the, the things that you would eat and all of those things. That's now talking about the way that they were under the law. And underneath the law, it controlled every aspect of their life. And underneath the law, you needed to keep a good kosher home. Do you know how hard it was to keep a good kosher home? How much work that was? It was an enormous amount of work. But here was the thing. They thought that they were now going to be acceptable to God because of all of the hard work that they were doing. 
And so the writer of Hebrews is reminding us, look, it, it does not matter. Your hard work is not what makes you acceptable to God. That's not the avenue of connection that you have. The avenue of connection that you have with God that you'll always have with God is grace. It's by God's grace through faith now that we are connected to him. We never will earn our righteousness and we're never going to earn God's acceptance. We are always going to be connected to him by his grace and through faith. And that is our connection. So once we're saved, don't try and maintain your relationship with God by working for it. You didn't work for it to get it. You're not going to work for it to be able to maintain it. It's by grace. Understand that. God loves you. Isn't that amazing? God's always loved you. God will always love you. And he's connected himself to you by grace. That is your connection. Always remember that. Don't get pulled aside. Now, in verse 10, he says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. So on the day of atonement, they would have the sacrifice that would take away the sins of the nation. But that animal sacrifice, that was burned outside of the city. They would take the animal outside and he would be offered up there. Jesus Christ, he was now the lamb of God that took away the sins. Where was he sacrificed? outside of the city. They took him to Golgotha outside of the city. So he's showing that that was a typology with which Christ fulfilled when he was sacrificed outside of the city. Now he goes on to say, and therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach for here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Now, the temple was inside of Jerusalem. And so Jesus was crucified outside. And so they were saying now that you need to leave the old covenant and you need to now head out to Christ to follow after Christ. And so we're going to leave that old covenant. It says we're leaving behind the city that was built with hands in pursuit of what? The city that's not built with hands, the heavenly Jerusalem. And so this is the whole point of Hebrews right here. Therefore, let us go forth to him. Let us leave behind the old covenant and the temple worship. And now let us enter into the fullness. Let's go forth to Christ. He says in verse 15, therefore by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So we're to offer up a sacrifice of praise. So when we worship God with our lips and with our mouth, that is pleasing unto God. But he says, don't let the worship stop with just lip service to God. Also remember to share and to bless others. Remember to love others as well. He says in verse 17, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you. And so here what, here's what this verse is saying. It says that we as believers should conduct ourselves in such a way that promotes the unity of the body. That, that's what it's talking about. Not to be divisive and to be complaining and to be rebellious, but as a, a flock, as a body of Christ, we want to maintain the integrity of unity. And so this is really focused at unity. Verse 18, pray for us. For we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. So praying for us, we see that the writer of Hebrews is now stating that he considered it the important to be praying for others and in particularly for the leadership. I want you to know that every congregation should be praying for its, its pastors. And so I wanna urge you and encourage you to be praying for the pastors. God has collected such an amazing group of pastors here on this staff. I am blown away 
by the quality of these men that God has placed here to lead this church. But I want you to know that we need, we need prayer, okay? And we need your prayers to be able to run that interference so that we can continue to do a good job of leading forth uh, our flock here. So be praying for your pastors. Uh, verse 20, now, may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. In these two verses, there's 25 sermons <laughs> right here. I mean, they're just every single line of this is an absolute sermon. But, uh, but here we see the God of peace. Listen, that's what God wants for you. God wants a rich, thick life. He wants your heart to be still. He wants it to be safe. He wants you to feel loved. He wants you to be without strife. Don't strive with others. Don't fight with others. Don't yell and bicker and quarrel and let the flesh get in and destroy everything. He wants you to live in harmony and peace with each other and with him. He is the God of peace. And that's what he wants for your life. And so pursue that. Pursue that peace in your life. And that peace with him is found through Christ. And peace through one another is found through the bond of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He says in verse 22, And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. So he says, listen to my instruction and don't, don't turn a deaf ear to it. Sometimes, you know, we can feel like as all of these exhortations are there, we're like, I'm not doing this and I'm not doing this and I'm not doing this. And the enemy can come in and try and condemn you. But here's the reality. This is just the instruction that God's giving us to help us. And so, so don't feel chastened by it. God's revealing truth to you. And here's what I want to point out. Whatever truth is striking you today, take notice of it in your life. God loves you. He's trying to lead you to green pastures and to still waters. He's trying to lead you to greater blessing in your life. So don't argue with them and don't fight with them and don't resist him. Don't let the enemy come in and condemn you. Just open up your heart, listen to what he's saying and let him lead you. He has your best interest in heart. You can trust the one that's trying to lead you because he loves you so much. And so he says in verse 23, know that our brother Timothy has been set free with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. So we don't really have any information on Timothy's imprisonment. Um, a lot on Paul's imprisonment, but not on Timothy's. Here again, this may be internal evidence that this is Paul that's writing uh, this letter. This next verse also gives us internal evidence that Paul may be the writer of Hebrews. In verse 24, greet all those who rule over you and all the saints, those from Italy greet you. So the writer wrote from Italy. And remember, Paul was, of course, imprisoned in Rome. And so this may have been written by Paul as one of his... Uh, prison epistles, uh, uh, but here again, we don't have conclusive evidence on that. In verse 25, grace be with you all, amen. And so he closes the book with grace. What a perfect close, because what was the whole letter about? It was about coming underneath the law of the old covenant and coming into the grace of the new covenant. And so we are connected to God, not by law, but by grace. As we close our study here, I want to draw our attention for just a minute to verse 6. And in verse 6, look with me, it says, So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. And that was what I really wanted to leave us with this morning, was to not be afraid. To not be afraid. He says, I will not fear. It means that I'm going to choose not to be afraid. And how do we choose not to be afraid? Now, everybody's going to have trials and difficulties and hardships. And when we come to those hardships, the natural response, the emotion that's invoked in our lives to uncertainty is anxiousness and fear to the degree that the threat is to the degree that we are going to experience those things. But here's the thing. God never wanted us, listen, 
God never wanted us to sit here and to wring our hands with the uncertainty of life of what's coming. God knows everything. Amen. He says, trust me, I know what's coming. He says, and I don't want you to be afraid. Now, fear and faith, they live in opposition to each other. Fear drives out faith, but faith drives out fear. And so we see that God now is saying, if you're connected to me by faith, guess what? That fear is going to be departed. But when you look at the trials, when you look at the circumstances, when you lose sight of God, what happens is anxiousness and fear starts to fill you up. God's desire for your life is that you would walk through your trials with your eyes on him, trusting him by faith, knowing that A, he loves you. B, he's never going to leave you. C, he already saw this coming. It, it, it's not a surprise to him. He didn't look down and say, oh no, I forgot you. <laughs> What's going on in your life? Kind of like, you know, you have burnt toast, you know, it's like, oh no, I forgot it's in the toaster. You know, oh, sorry. <laughs> your life kind of <laughs> got burnt up. <laughs> here, I'll scrape off some of that black on you here and, you know, try and put some jelly on and save it. You know, I mean, <laughs> God never does that uh, with you. He loves you. More than words can ever even begin to express. You need to know that. You need to feel that. You need to walk in the reality of that. He has a good plan for your life. And if you're going through a difficult time right now, just remember to get your eyes on him. Do not be afraid. He won't leave you. He will see you through it. It will have a good outcome in the eternal perspective. And when it's all said and done, you're going to be in his presence for all eternity. So he wants us to be at peace. And he wants you to not be afraid. Walk boldly. Walk boldly in that faith. Walk boldly in knowing that you're loved. Trust God with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Just in all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. He will help you through the struggle that you're going. May we be able to say today, I will not fear. Say that with me. I will not fear. Let's pray. Father, thank you. May that be a reality in our life. May we be able to walk in that truth. And would you help us and empower us into that truth in our life? So, Father, thank you for your word that instructs us. Help us today to receive your truth and to navigate according to it. You've given us free will and you've given us truth. And now it's up to us. So, Lord, may you impart the wisdom into us that's necessary to abide by your word that we might be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.